welcome back to another podcast. It's me, Teej, your host today, and we have got two young people on the line with us today. Let's get them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Shreya. I'm 16 and I live in Hertfordshire. Hi, I'm Fodia. I'm 16 as well and I live, I live in East London. I'm guessing those sirens are East London sirens. They sounded like East London yeah. sirens to me. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> You guys were in year 11 last year, done your GCSEs, completed, finished. Results day was not that long ago, just a few days ago. How did we do? Um, I did pretty well. I'm really pleased with what I got. Really proud of my sister's results as well. I think it was good, really good. Like, it wasn't what I was expecting, but I still got like the grades that I really close to what I wanted. Um, and I got the grades to go to my first choice sixth form, which was Brampton, because, well, they have pretty high entry requirements to get in. So that was, I got in. So I'm really happy about that. Flex it, flex it. <laughs> uh, did you get into, did you get into your uh, college of choice, Shreb? Yes, I did. Um, yeah, with flying colours and I'm really proud of that. I was looking at some statistics about the number of A's that have been given over like COVID and stuff. Uh, which had doubled compared to previous years. Um, so they're trying to raise the bar again. Now we've got exams. So your year group was the first year group to be a little bit more scrutinised than the previous couple of years. Yeah. Um, and so it was harder to get grades compared to the last two years, but still easier than three years ago. Everyone, every single person in my school at least, experienced like their grades dropping and most people got way below what they expected. And I think it's because of the grade inflation, but also it's like, um, so they, like the grade boundaries were really high and stuff. They started, they tried to raise the standard, but still a lot of people were affected by it. And a lot yeah. of people didn't, weren't able to go to the colleges they wanted to or do the courses they wanted to. There's been a lot of talk recently, I guess, um, because I mean, Tony Blair and his foundation have also weighed in the whole exam structure and situation thing of it. Uh, so like some of the statistics uh, that I, I, I didn't mention, but I kind of touched on earlier was they were saying the so pre-covid the grade boundary was 22 percent of people getting a a stars right or a grades i can't remember if it was a grades or a stars and post covid well during covid it went up to 44 percent because it was based on teacher thingies and i think this year they've tried to reduce it to 38 percent um 25 percent or just shy of 25 percent of people drop out of their university course in the first year uh, which is up from about 10% pre-COVID um, because obviously the inflation, um, the, the grade inflation that's, that's, that is, that, you know, come about and everything like that. Um, do you think, and I, I mean, uh, th th this question is a little bit more specific to what we've previously talked about. Do you think the exam system is broken or do you think like or, already broken or do you think, and COVID just exposed it, or do you think COVID broke the system? It's not fair because um, one booklet of information get like written by um, some examiner that should not have to determine two years worth of work and COVID has shown up this to us due to the fact that so many people were having to self-learn and we can't really examine how successful that was due to the use of tags instead of like the grades it was i get what you're trying to say and i think it was definitely unfair because there were so many schools that didn't like some schools had better resources than others some school had a like more like had the ability to kind of like be able to teach their skills their kids remotely other schools had no contact with students like during the lockdowns and when they had to self-isolate so I think that something that we, like one of my teachers once said was that G, like GCSEs and the way our like our exam system works, it doesn't measure intelligence, it measures difference. Do you think that's a problem that's always existed or do you think COVID just, it just happened during COVID? Like have schools always been unequal in terms of the quality of, you know, provision um, and therefore certain people will, will just naturally, not naturally, but based on location and where they go to school, will just naturally do better than others. I think that like 
I think it's a problem that's always existed. There's always been a divide like between state schools and private schools and like their access to higher education and high paying jobs and etc. Like there's always been so much like division um in that like in the education system and inequality. But I think that um COVID and like the pandemic it just made it so much worse because um you had because you still had hard you still had had work, like really hard work, working students in state schools in really deprived areas still showing up to school still showing up to lessons still learning and putting in effort in order to be able to get the top grades and maybe go and progress into a really high paying job in oxbridge and all of that but because of covid that wasn't even possible because those kids were probably stranded at home with a bunch of textbooks if they even had the money to afford textbooks in the first place um which a lot of them didn't and they have to teach themselves content that obviously they're not going to understand but because they're 11 to 16 year olds yeah no i totally agree with that i definitely think that covid has kind of widened the, like even though there's like some sort there's like a spectrum of how easily schools are able to deal with this sort of thing i think covid has definitely brought more tension to this spectrum because of statistics showing a greater num- lot like a larger number of students not receiving grades that they should be based on our limited experiences and knowledge of the whole system what would what kind of what if you could give one suggestion one change to make what would that be in my area we have two we have got some really like good like we've got loads of schools with good reputations but we've also got lots of schools with bad reputations and it's not and and a lot of people who have these like like preconceived like notions about these schools no one blames it on the actual running of the school itself but it's a lot about the attitudes of the students personally I've said this before I think I would like the UK to do the same thing as Finland I think it was Finland where they don't have a private system where every single school is the same and the like there's no need for you to look for the best school because the best school is in your neighborhood I was literally going to ask you that like so you don't think that all schools should become public sector schools I think that when it comes to universities it makes sense when it comes mm. to universities it makes sense but mm. from the age of 3 when kids go into school all the way to 18 I think it is incredibly unfair to deny kids like legally like legally kids that like any sort of opportunity I think all kids should have the same opportunity cool. I won't argue with any of that <laughs> I no, think if you go into politics guys I'm going to make it happen. Yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 a difficult one. Yeah, when you get into politics, do you know what I mean? You know you've got my vote already, right? Yeah. Yeah, me um, too. But yeah, no, it's a difficult one because then you've got like obviously like kids with like special needs or disabilities or things like that, you know. I think uh, there's a certain bias as well in terms of um how we look at the you know people with with certain difficulties and the quality that of teaching that they might get and the assumptions that are made uh, in terms of their abilities and things like that you know um i don't think we automatically look at someone in a wheelchair and think that could be the next Stephen Hawkins whereas we look at people who aren't in a wheelchair and say that could be the next Stephen Hawkins you know <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> Stephen Hawkins yeah <laughs> Um yeah. Um okay, let's 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 move on to a slightly different topic then. Global warming still soaring. Pakistan is underwater. Global warming is still here. Yeah, it's not gone away. <laughs> yeah, the next kind of like country like in the third world second world country is like drowning, but yeah, with the west doesn't still care like. Yeah. <laughs> If you're going to say up north towards Manchester, yeah. right, and you're on the M1, uh the one of the routes you can take is called Snake Path, right? And it basically takes you it's like high up in the hills. um and they've got a, a series of reservoirs along the way and i'm not joking those reservoirs were almost bone dry when i was driving down and this was just like this like last week the west is drying up but the east is underwater like what's yeah, going it's on yeah it's just drastic effects and oh my god this summer i'm never going to like all my friends were just thinking that i was being annoying but i made it a point to post on my social media especially on instagram i kept like taking pictures like like not every day but like at least two or three times a week i would take pictures of parks and etc and i would just show oh i'm still, like and i would always say the same thing in the caption still looking for a patch of green grass 
and it got annoying because I kept doing it the entire summer and I did find a patch of green grass and it was in an area that was um, near the Olympic Park that was basically like taken care of because there were restaurants and stuff like that in that like in that area and they were taking care of that area in the park and it was constantly kind of kept like under like ideal conditions and I was like found a grand like would you call it you know a green patch of grass but it's like in public parks and everything there's no green grass I think in London was it I think East London had had some random spontaneous fires in people's homes yeah I think we that. did yeah. do you think people are taking this serious like do you think people are taking this serious like no I generally don't think they're taking it seriously I think the environment is not being taken seriously because basically this week I spent quite a bit of time writing this essay um um, but it was basically this essay on the like the environmental effects of uh, nuclear like uh, atomic bombs and chemical spills and like during like doing the research I kind of realized how like so many accidents happen and sometimes there's kind of allegations and there's lawsuits and etc but most of the time no one is held accountable and everything and there's like there's so many like the world is already so damaged like because i was reading this one paper saying that kind of like um atomic bombs like the only time they were actually used in combat were also obviously hiroshima and nagasaki but other than that there's been um over like a thousand tests or so like um all around the world i mean actually i can give you the exact number because i have my yeah so there's been um uh tests conducted all around the world 530 were um in the atmosphere um, a few in the underwater and 1,517 1, tests underground. So that's atomic bombs that were just tested. And obviously we've seen what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Imagine that happening 1,517 1, plus 530 times. That's a lot. Um, and that's, that's over 2,000 times. So that's obviously shocking. And 44% of those um, were carried out in Nevada and there's they've actually done research like in the last like in the last couple of decades and they found out that there's this kind of uh this i don't even know what it's called it's, it's basically this radioactive isotope that's found in nevada and it's one of the factors that has led to such an increase in what yeah thyroid cancer in that area and obviously stuff like that keeps happening in all of these sites in all of these areas there's been so many accidents well not accidents there's been so much damage already caused and the world hasn't even recovered from that but then you think that's already happening and that's in the past and like obviously we're still dealing with that we haven't fixed that and then every single day we're we're causing even more damage like what are we doing to the planet i guess i'm definitely i get i live in quite a, a bit of a bubble so i'm still kind of trying to learn the extent of how bad it really is because like on the one hand i'm getting all of this like you know like the reality of it but then on the other hand there's so many things trying to cushion it out for me being like oh this is fine but remember that Bhutan is like the only carbon neutral or carbon negative um, like country in the world and I'm kind of I guess I remember as I was like beginning to learn it I was I used to feel very conflicted about it all but I guess over time um, I've kind of I'd say I've opened my eyes a bit now and I'm definitely trying to like do a bit more but I'd say because everyone I guess has a very similar mentality to mine being like oh it's it's important but i guess so i guess i'll do like the bare minimum um i don't think obviously it's not very sustainable so i d i would say i am concerned like i'm quite concerned but uh, i i just i guess i just need i j i'm just i'm one of those people who like i just need it to, i need to ha i need it to happen like very close to home before i completely understand it's like terrible but so i, I think i think you represent quite a lot of people actually especially i mean in terms of people yeah. i know and and from what fajir said i think a lot of people that you know as well i think it's that well it's not happening to me like everything will be all right i'm imagining that you know that meme of the of the little cartoon dog and they're like on fire and yeah, like, yeah 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 it's all right it's all right <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say something really similar in the sense that like people will not it's not happening to them but it's gonna like it's currently affecting some people um around the world but it's like gonna affect slowly gonna affect like it's gonna affect our kids and I feel like that's when it's gonna people are gonna until something I feel like most of the West doesn't care because it doesn't hit home even me I was just like 
yeah it's global warming whatever my yeah. kids can figure it out my grandkids can figure it out but then I, like recently i realized hey i'm not gonna have a country like i literally my country is underwater um you know like bangladesh is not gonna exist in the next like 100 years so um i think that when things like that like if things like that hit home that's when it's gonna have an effect and it's like it's something like i know it's not like related to global well i mean the issue itself like to understand it, i feel like people need to experience it because there's been so many bombings there's been so many wars and everything there's been so many killings and etc but the only time people stood up to the world like people are, like like the whole thing with palestine has been happening forever now and like there's been so many wars there's been so many conflicts happening there's been co- there's still concentration camps in china like you know like yeah for muslims but people only paid attention like not only paid attention people really stood up for ukraine and obviously that's mm-hmm. amazing we love that we love that they're standing up for ukraine that's unfair but the west only stood up because it hit close to home because it hit because, them yeah yeah because those were ukrainian families you would have seen them they're europeans they would have lived next door to you but if it's palestine if it's like people from like the middle east if it's from a lower income country is brown is brown skinned people is women in hijabs is people that you're not like that don't relate that you can't relate to that you can't see yourself you're not gonna people are not gonna want to do anything about it and that's quite dangerous and i think that if a country like i don't know if france suddenly like is underwater trust me people are gonna start caring about global warming just a couple of months ago i say there were you know half of london was on fire just randomly spontaneously combusted right because of how dry it was we've had water shortages and hose pipe bans um all across the country um our farming is absolutely decimated and now we're you know an individual country we're not part of the EU you know that's put a lot of pressure yeah. on, on us in terms of uh, food production i think they're saying like potatoes will be half the size uh for the next you know quite for quite a long time for quite a few years now and things like carrots and things like all the things that we grow will be smaller and they'll be more expensive right so it'll be like it'll be like a freddo right when they used to be 10p and now they're like 50p and they're smaller right <laughs> that's going to be like our potatoes and and everything like that you know like do you, do do you think the country literally has to either burn or go under water before we we start we we turn again oh actually i think we should do something about this now 1000% it needs to hit close to home honestly you, yeah <laughs> like it only began to hit me when like i was on holiday and i was in india and then um i my all my friends were telling me like how hot it was back back home in england and i realized that it was like it was reaching temperatures like hotter than in india and this is like you know peak summer and i was like so shocked and that that's kind of the first time i realized what well, like wow this is kind of serious so i think because because it kind of happened to like the uk that's kind of why i kind of like i understood how severe it was but even though there were like reports of the same thing happening in like like other countries like you know America you know California the California wildfires the Australian wildfires i didn't really pay too much attention to them i just thought oh poor australia i hope they can get over this but now that it kind of like it's beginning to like hit home now it's kind of like oh this is this is a problem yeah and it's like something that you kind of like realize like the government isn't even putting that much emphasis there was a point where Boris Johnson was talking about the environment but now currently all you hear in parliament is about taxes 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 but like the taxes are obviously important but you're not even going to your your home might randomly combust that's also important you know we'll come on to that in a minute actually because i think that's that's really interesting especially with who we're looking at, at having our next prime minister in Well, the day uh, Shreya starts um, her college. Is it? Is it Shreya? Yeah, but the day Shreya starts her college um, on the sixth or fifth. Oh my God! Did I ever tell you guys? Wait, wait, wait. One thing. Did I ever tell you guys what the reaction of the school I was at, like when Boris Johnson like resigned? Were they upset? No, you no, don't. They have to be. No, basically, we were like um I was in a, like an induction day like in another school, right? Um and I think it was in LA and basically like the guy like the head teacher was giving a speech and we were like there were like hundreds of kids sitting in the assembly hall, right? We're all from different schools, we're just there. And then um 
basically we hear like a loud cheer like we hear teachers screaming and stuff like that like in the hallway and the head teacher is just like i'm really sorry guys and he was embarrassed because these were his teachers that were like acting like kids so he went out for a few minutes and he came back in and he was just like well um the teachers and everyone is, are celebrating because boris johnson just decided, decided to resign and everyone in the hall were just like clapping and cheering oh and screaming. my god like, it was one of the best moments of the best possible reaction to that i was like oh my god yes um but it's like i don't know it just shows how much like even the younger generation hate him like how we hate politicians and currently we have three options that are not even we have options that are not not great not the greatest yeah yeah, yeah and we have yeah. Rishi Sunak like trying to use <laughs> the fact that he's brown to like show that he's part of he he is not a part of us i'm sorry as a brown person i can say that he is not he is not part of us He's only really, Yeah. I re- I remember I was telling Teach the other day because I my politics knowledge is like next to zero and I was I was telling him that oh if I if it came to me having to choose someone I'd like choose Rishi Sunak because like he's brown and that's the only reason I had. No, and I feel like I because of that like every other like brown like adult who knows nothing about politics like me would kind of that be like oh he's brown of course. Yeah, but the thing is right currently it's just it's just I'm not even going to lie. You know, I went to the bank for this one time, right? Just to like, what do you call it? There was something wrong with my card. And this man, he's just like, "Oh, what do you want to study?" And I was like, "Oh, I want to study politics. I might want to go into the politics." It's like, "Oh, what are you into?" And he's just like, "Oh, you must like love the representation we have going on. There's so many This was like a white middle-aged man, right? Working in a bank, working at HSBC. So, yeah, like he probably has money. He is like stereotypical British person, but he's just like, um, oh, you must like uh, like you, you have so much representation now. Like there's so many people like you and Paul and Rishi Sunak. You have Priti Patel and I'm just like, "Excuse me, Priti, no. Priti Patel is the woman that's trying to kick me out of this country <laughs> even though even though we might have been related or somewhere down the line. I don't understand. What what are you on about?" Um and I then I went on. And it's like the representation like the Tory group, they use it's like in this Republic like the Republican Party in America did the same thing like when Trump was having his whole re-election campaign thing he brought like black people to speak his black like, what do you call it his black um senators to speak and like now the Tory party has so many brown spe- people speaking out is because they're doing it because they're kind of showing we're not racist we are so accepting and etc but what do you call it Rishi Sunak had such a privileged upbringing he went to a private school he went into investment banking he had so much money he does not he does not face the struggles that usual brown people do like us brown people do and priti patel she's a brown person but she's kicking brown people out of the country that is her plan like that is what she wants to do like how are we being represented when the people that are supposed to represent us are the people that are targeting us the most because who is being affected by taxes and etc like what do you call it like people that are working class people that are like quite disprivileged especially in areas like mine where it's mostly predominantly brown people and it's black people and it's people of color and it's people that are so disadvantaged and immigrants but maybe may- maybe that's the point that's the point that is the point they maybe use- that's, that's what they're trying to do in it That's, they're trying to not be racist but they are they are racist and they're mm-hmm. picking people they're picking people they're, pick, they're picking faces to not be racist like if it was a white person saying we're going to be sending people to Rwanda um i think there would be some assassinations happening but now that we have a brown woman doing it mm-hmm. people are less mad because they feel like that they're, because they're kind of associating like that's what brown people want do i want immigrants do I want do you or do I want refugees from Palestine going to Rwanda no I don't as a brown person no I don't as a muslim exactly. person exactly none of us do you know how you're talking about how like you know we've got a we've got a brown person who everyone thinks are representing what brown people want except for the brown people i was thinking that you know how this cultural appropriation right i again i'm i'm this is on me basically this is a shameless plea for me like just to learn a bit more about it but like you know how there's cultural pro- pro- appropriation which what i know is like y- like it, like using like aspects of culture without fully understanding what it means could you say that even like for example if you had an indian person wearing like a bindi but having like no idea what that means or how that significant culture culturally would that count as like cultural appropriation in 
contrast to maybe a white person wearing a bindi but like completely like having a full understanding on the like the cultural significance what would you say about that i mean that makes like i think that's like a really good way to put it because i'm just thinking about like an actual example of something like that but i mean for example like one example could be like clothes like some of our traditional clothes are mixed with like western clothes and etc and that kind of thought as fashionable and trendy um but it's just that it's kind of losing its meaning like those are traditional clothes now mixed with western clothes you know and mm-hmm. it's just because like asos were set like would you call it like selling lehengas and stuff like that which is amazing yeah you know like would you call it like sell items and etc but it's just that i don't know some part of me feels like some clothing is quite traditional and etc and like just people should not be wearing it if they don't understand it um yeah. including items as well and it's like it's like wearing a hijab and like not really knowing what it means just being like oh, that is so fashionable yeah i totally agree like i can like for example my primary school was um so i don't know if you know what iscon is but it's like so it stands for like the international society for krishna consciousness so it's um and it was led by this um i don't know like what's called it like the saint or like there's the, the, like guruji Prachita Prabhupada, he came to America and he kind of spread the word of like Hinduism and like Krishna consciousness. And um, as a result, so many like American people converted to Hinduism. And you can see that like even today, like the there's a local like Hare Krishna temple. Um, and that's kind of where I, that's where I went to primary school. They have a primary school. And um, it was and um, in year seven, we had all gone on a school trip to that temple and because i'd gone to school there for 7 years i was already very accustomed to how it went but i remember every all my friends being really surprised about seeing like english people wear like sarees and bindis and like wearing like what they thought were like indian cultural clothing even though most likely like those people would have had more knowledge about what they were wearing than some of the indians that kind of commented on this so that's why i kind of was thinking about it because it's kind of how how westernized us like me, like my like not my like the Brown indian music yeah. has become to know that so that that they don't know why they wear all of this stuff yeah and are willing and are kind of questioning and it's like something that kind of like we kind of relates to this that kind of like whenever i think of like rishi suna or like um uh pretty patel i think of is that i was told for a while that like what you could especially if i want to go into something like law or politics like appearances really matter and like i remember like listening to michelle obama talking about something like this like if like what you could like because they get like michelle like um, like um and her daughters they all have like their um they have their hair chemically straightened so they don't have their natural afros or anything like that and they think the thing is the thing is really like because like in the pub in public image and like in politics in areas such as that like there the people that are usually there who are from another culture who are black or brown or any other minorities um they tend to be they tend to be quite like whitewashed not whitewashed but they yeah. tend to try to fit in and i remember i was told to do the same thing and i remember like actually like but especially with my accent i was told you're never going to get into politics with the accent you have because i had a really heavy like accent before not anymore because i learned how to kind of get rid of that um but stuff stuff like that or the stuff you wear like don't really wear an abaya or like if you wear like a hijab don't wear like all traditional clothing like maybe wear a suit and wear your hijab like that seems more approachable or like for example like it's stuff like that you know and it's like don't wear really bright bright colorful colors because like that's very kind of like you know in our cultures like bright colors and stuff like that don't really wear that like you know there's so many ways in which us as brown people and us as minorities we're kind of like our culture is slowly fading away because we are trying so hard to climb up the ladder of success and to become successful in western countries that we lose touch with our traditional selves and and i think rishi sunak and priti patel are a product of that and i think it is their fault i am in no way defending them but i think that is because it's because 
us as a brown like as the brown community and etc like we've tried so hard to fit in for so long that we've kind of neglected our culture to the point where like we kind of start dressing and start speaking and start believing in the conservative values and the kind of like the traditional british everything it's just so sad like i i remember we had um culture like I, me, along with a lot of other people who are also, our year is full of loads of like predominantly like Indian people, and we've been trying for so so long to have a day where we are allowed to like wear cultural Indian clothes, and it took us only un- until like year eleven to finally be able to have that, and it was so sad like seeing. I remember I'd come, and normally even on like normal Mufti days, I used to come in with like Gucci tops and like. you know all like indian jewelry and everyone used to be like wow you look so nice and it used to make me sad because even if i were to wear normal clothes it would just be like i'd just be another person but because i came wearing my you know like like my cultural like costume that's when people kind of started noticing me a bit more and it's kind of sad that it people see like it like our cultural costume is so different because of the lack of exposure they've had and and it's even sad to see how like their parents are like are like actively encouraging it yeah and like something else that kind of like going back to the schools thing i'm not going to name the school but this is one of the reasons why i didn't go to them because they are kind of really well known as well in this area and anyone who is from east london and who knows brampton's kind of not really rivals but their competitions will know what school i'm going talking about but they kind of when they when i went to their open days whenever they advertised they always talked about how it's a holistic education and also they like they're known for that phrase holistic education and by that not only do, they they mean study and everything but they also fix you in the sense that they fix your brownness like they kind of teach you they teach you etiquette and how to talk and how to present yourself and etc which to one extent is okay is good you know and etc but it's just like the whole aim of it like i think at some point i felt uncomfortable like going to that school and i felt uncomfortable with the kind of like the way they were like advertising it as they will fix you in order for you to be able to fit in into the like you know they into oxbridge and into the predominantly white population and like kind of that top 1% like you know like they'll be able to they'll be able to polish you they always say polished so it's just i think stuff like that just makes me angry because it's like it's just you're saying that you have to be you have to like hold certain beliefs and like uh, like address and act a certain way in order to be able to kind of escape the cycle of poverty because it's not only because they the point they're making is that hard work and studying is not it you need to be polished you need to be fixed your blackness your brownness needs to be polished which i don't like i think uh, when we talk about cultural change like cult, you know culture being taken away and stuff like that but then one of the difficult things we have as uh, as a non native community right in the country is that um and that you know i think it's a horrible term because actually there's been like black africans living in the uk from before the anglo-saxons arrived in the country right so uh yes yeah, it's, it's a bit of a strange concept but um culture is to do with place right and this country has a culture has its own culture right and if if people are bringing like i guess part part of the argument if people are bringing cultures from elsewhere to here and there's always going to be this idea of integration right but you know how would it be if you know how 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 did we feel when or how you know because uh, you mentioned india and pakistan between the two of you right <laughs> you know what are your thoughts about the british coming over and uh, ruling india when it was one single country and anglicizing the country you know essentially they're doing what we're complaining about wanting to do here the thing is we're not we're not taking over their land by force and we're not forcing no 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 and 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 yeah i mean some people would argue that we are right <laughs> no but the thing is really well, in terms in terms of the so when when britain were in india and you know even before the 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 raj existed 
right? There was this there was this movement, and if you look at China as well, which was you know wasn't really um, conquered by the British, right? Um, th there was this movement of anglicizing a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is is I think it's difficult when we talk about culture because I think culture is just so changeable and so yeah, I think people people are stuck in some culture like some cultural practices and some people aren't and some people are willing to change and it's just you know i think i get what you're trying to say but i just want to make this point clear that like when it comes to like the british empire for example like when they went to india they destroyed hindustan in many ways as in they not only changed our culture like they sexualized so many things like our clothing like our saris changed like the way women draped their saris changed they were more covered up because the British were sexualizing things. Our country was split up into modern day Bangladesh, Pakistan, India. Our religions, which are predominantly like Hinduism and Islam, became hostile towards each other because they created that divide. They took so many things from our country and they changed our countries as well to now be three countries, to now be co different cultures. But like, what do you call it? And now slowly people are starting to realize at the end of the day, we're this, you know, we're from like the same culture and everything. Like we were divided because of the British empire. And and the thing is, right, um, with us here in the UK, um, that is not, we're not trying to change the culture here. We're like, the British culture is built on imperialism. It is built on the fact that they colonized so much of the world. That, and the thing is that we're not trying to kind of change their culture per se. We're trying to be ourselves and be accepted as who we are. And the thing is something that kind of annoys me, it's not really relevant to this, that really annoys me, is that people always say, like people say to us, to us immigrants, that um, we should be grateful that we're given an opportunity to live in this country, that we're free education and this and that. Um, but it was after the second world war, it like, Churchill and like so many like the politicians here they asked British soldiers and British like well, not British soldiers they asked like uh, people from Hindustan to come over and help fix their countries and now we're told that oh you should be grateful that you're allowed to live in this country you should be grateful that we give you the opportunity to be here and therefore you should adapt to our culture and our western values and believe in what we believe and dress the way we dress because we're giving you a chance when people when our ancestors literally came and fixed the country for them because after the second world war Britain was in ruins. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think I think in that sense, I don't think they were expecting people to stay. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> you think, get, think yeah, well, we need um, to get something but, out of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of, and we'll move on. I, I want to move on to our, our main question, but I think it's it's interesting when you said about you know people are now understanding that we're all like a Desi people, because mm -hmm. I think if you if I think in this country there seems to be a, a movement. Uh, a shift in in understanding somewhat right i know some extremes in in both sides of this argument right um but when i when i look at the the countries of india and pakistan right both countries now who have nationalist governments in place and i think the mood in those countries is very much nationalist yeah. right um i think within those countries you know there seems to be a movement of like in pakistan is you know removing hindu concepts and in 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 india removing muslim concepts you know and uh, it's it, i think it's yeah it's an interesting it's an interesting thought that in terms of what you said about you know this this change of movement i'm, I'm not sure i see it on a global scale i think in a microcosm no i think it's changing in here it's changing because of social media because of research because of the internet because i have learned all of this from like uh what do you call it like watching videos and etc and listening to other people talk and like attending discussion sessions because there is so much there like we're taught like not me per se because i never did history um by the way i did geography but it's like so many people have taught spoke has spoken out on the internet about how they were taught that like the british went over to india and they like started the first universities like they educated our people we had an education we had we had a booming economy before the british showed up and i yeah. know that even today we are still benefiting and i am and everyone in this like what do you call it podcast is like podcast is benefiting from imperialism and is benefiting from the british empires in some way in some way but yeah. the thing is is that the perception that most of britain like historically has had of our countries is quite negative and it's just it's just horrible and it's just like it's, it's just it just doesn't sit right with me when when people say that we don't 
that we would you call it like we're an epidemic because certain people have said that like immigrants are an epidemic they're coming into this country and they're stealing away our culture and they're stealing away our things and like they're just being lazy and not doing anything while your country is built on immigrants unfortunately we have to say goodbye to Shreya I'll see you guys next week <laughs> kind of overrun a little bit main question of today right which i wanted to kind of get out because there, there, there's going to be a lot of people starting a new school secondary school mm -hmm. right you're now going on to college right so you've come through you've come through the experience and the system right uh a few tips and tricks uh to to help people navigate coming into a new school whether that be into year seven or whether that be moving to a new school you know some of the things you might be doing now you're going to a, a new college yeah. right where you might not know everybody mm -hmm. uh, what what kind of survival tips do you have what do's and don'ts do okay have? so i have a lot of tips for this especially because i not only moved schools i moved countries three years ago um, so if there's anyone moving countries or moving cities or whatever, there's also tips for them. So I think that's something really important is to not, not try and I think a lot of people, what they do is they try and like see the vibe and kind of go with everyone else and do what the, what the trends are in that area or that school, wherever. And I think that's kind of like, don't do that. I think that one of the most important things you can do is kind of be true to yourself and try and find out who you are. And going into school, like going into secondary school, six forms, um, I think the best way to do that is to join extracurriculars or clubs um, or even sports. Like if you're not really a nerdy person, then maybe join sports clubs. I think you make a lot of friends there. And if there's something you enjoy and you dedicate time to like after school or during lunch times, and you're gonna you're gonna meet people that kind of feel the same passion. Um, towards that thing because they're also dedicating their time and I think I've met my best friends and the most the people that I have met that I'm closest to through clubs and extracurriculars um, and through kind of exploring my own passions um, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to because when I first came into my secondary school in year eight I had a very different friendship group to what my friends look like right now um, and it's because I had certain interests then and then I kind of found myself and found the things that made me passionate um like th that are my passion so um i think that's one of the best ways so clubs extracurriculars um something else would be to um really and truly do not try and find a group of friends because i think that this is still like i know we make fun of it like oh my god is this like high school musical like clicks and stuff like that that's so stupid but that still exists and those clicks exist in a different forms and and in very different forms now and there is um there's a downside to every single group and every single click and there's so many groups of friends and there's a lot of people like myself that are trying to fit into those groups and we don't completely fit in like i've tried to be a part of the like for example the drama kids and etc sometimes i think i am way too nerdy to be part of the drama kids then it's like the, you have the academic kids that like i tried to be part of that friendship group too and then i realized that was really toxic because their entire existence is defined by the academic validation and that's not also not right so there's always groups and there's always something wrong with them and so do not try and fit into a group i have five four people slash five people that i'm really close with and they all have their own little group slash clicks but i'm not part of that i'm not part of their groups i'm friends with all of their friends all of their groups but i'm not part of them. i think that's something that would be incredibly helpful if you're trying to i know it's hard but if you're trying to navigate through school and be happy with yourself and not be upset and feel kind of like you don't fit in because it's better for you to be happy with yourself than be in a group of friends where you feel upset all the time where you feel like you don't fit in and i think my last tip would be to kind of bear in mind that you're meeting new people and they will not be friendly or accepting a lot like a lot of the time they won't be friendly or accepting straight away and i think that so what some people do is that they put on a persona in order to be liked and i know that kids especially going into year seven and year eight i know that's when it's the hardest i think when they go into six home well i don't know yeah because i'm going to six home i'm starting this friday but i'm hoping they'll be a bit more mature hoping please um but especially for year sevens i think that you guys might feel like 
um, really isolated because your personality doesn't match with everyone else's because you might be too nerdy or you might be too into sports or you might be too into something. But I think that people eventually grow to love that. I know that I was pretty lonely in year eight and like year nine even um, because I was quite a nerdy person and I loved doing extracurriculars and I was just didn't, I couldn't find people like myself, but I know that especially in year 10 and year 11, most of my year group really warmed up to me. And I know that I still get messages like, it's been months since we left school. I still get messages from like random people that's be like, oh, I just remembered you today. How are you doing and et cetera. People, if you stay true to yourself, people will always come find you. Um, I remember something that my singing teacher once said, um, and it basically that my singing teacher said that like he you when you try and follow other people your uh what do you call it you're kind of trying to just like you're kind of acting like a parasite like you're acting like a mosquito and people find that annoying and that's why you shouldn't try and follow people around you shouldn't try and follow trends or anything like that you should be more of yourself because when you are sitting there by yourself like a bird looking pretty doing your own thing people are going to be drawn to you. And you don't want to be a mosquito. You want to be a beautiful flamenco, okay? So that's it for me. I was talking to some of my nieces. Um, they're, they're younger than you, but yeah, they were, they, all I could get out of them was don't be a dork, which they never expanded on. I have no idea what that means, right? So- I befriended all the um, dorks. Can I just say, I befriended <laughs> all the dorks, all the so-called losers and outcasts. And let me tell you, they're going to the tabletop colleges. They somehow had the most amazing glow ups and they're just really, really cool people. And everyone want to be, want to be friends with them now. But I'm just like, oh, I befriended them when they were so-called labeled losers. Bye guys. Sure. They're my best friends. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was a dork back in school. I was quite happily a dork, you know? <laughs> like, Yo, you're a really cool person now. <laughs> um, I was what do you mean right now? I was always a cool person. Because oh yeah, I was of course, cool. of course. Do you know what I mean? Cool. I was never part of the crowd. I was never part of any single crowd. You know? Yeah, it's a flex. <laughs> when year seven, you want to be a part of the crowd. But when you grow up, it's a, it's a flex to not be a part of any crowd because you can be your own person and you can be yourself, you know? And you can grow up to be whoever you want to be. Because if you kind of pick your GCSE subjects, like because your friends did it, you're going to end up regretting it. If you do certain things because your friends did it, you're going to regret it. So just do things that you love. And on that note, we're gonna we're gonna finish it there. We're gonna finish it there. We're gonna yeah, write off right now. Do you know what I mean? So um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, you know all that good stuff. Uh, hit that bell icon. I don't know where it is on my screen. It's somewhere. Oh, anyway, yeah, uh, and we shall catch you all next week. See you later. Bye. Uh